Hey guys, welcome back. It's Ripe again, back with more relationship stories. In this video, my entitled gold digger parents tried to steal my property, but I taught them a lesson. Here is what happened. Let's dive right into the video. The title story starts like this. Most people think of gold diggers in the sense of a relationship, so I never really saw the signs of it in my parents growing up. Maybe it is just because I trusted them or wanted to believe everything they did was right, but the signs were clearly there from the time I was a teenager. They told me that I needed to get a job, saying it would look good for my future and job experience is really important. So I went with it and felt like some extra money would also be nice. I got a crappy job at a pizza place that I wanted to quit about a hundred times, but never did because my parents convinced me quitting my first job meant I would never find another one. Each paycheck they would take some off and told me that they were putting it away so I did not spend it all. I assumed again that they were just helping me since teenagers are not the most responsible with money. Fast forward to me being a junior in high school and applying to colleges, they were mad that I was spending money on applications at all, telling me it was just throwing away money. Weird, but I didn't focus too much on it and when I got into college I expected them to be excited, but instead they seemed a little bit upset about the whole thing. When I turned 18, a few months later, they sat me down and explained that I was an adult now and had to either pay them rent or move out. I was confused as this had never been explained before and they didn't want like a little bit of money, they wanted like actual apartment price rent. I explained I couldn't do that much working part time, they told me that I shouldn't have gone to college and instead gotten a full time job. They allowed me to stay with reduced rent so I could finish high school and start college. So for those maybe not in the United States or just don't know about how the federal loans for college work, there's oftentimes extra money after they pay the school. And they give you a check. It's not really free money since it's part of the loan, but a lot of college students take it and blow it on buying cool stuff. My parents were basically stalking my mail for weeks waiting for it to come. When it did, they told me that I had to give them the money. I was still living at home and commuting to school at that point. I was angry about it, but did not have a choice if I wanted to keep living in the house. The next semester, I managed to get a dorm, which for me was actually cheaper than living at home and paying rent to my parents. This time, they did not get my extra check money and were beyond angry about it. It was around this time, I finally figured out that they were gold diggers and I had enough of their crap. Me, look, I'm not living at home for most of the year. I want to be able to focus on school and not trying to work a ton of hours just to pay rent to my own parents. Can you give me the money you saved while I was working through high school? I can use that to rent a place. Dad, that money is long gone. Me, I thought you were saving it for me. Dad, that was your rent back then. You're really entitled. Me, you told me that you were putting that money away for me. You stole it. My dad, I didn't steal it. We deserved that money. We gave you food in a room. Me, because that is what parents do. We had a huge fight that lasted weeks of talking back and forth before things finally just imploded. They told me at the end that I basically had two choices I could make. Stay in school and I would be totally on my own. I would not have a family anymore since clearly I did not want to help make it work by contributing. Or option number two, I could drop out of school and get a full-time job and give them a portion of the money regardless of where I was going to live. Telling me that I owed them for the first 18 years of my life and was being selfish for not wanting to pay them back. I picked option number one and it was not some easy decision. They were my parents after all and I still love them despite the way that they were acting and treating me. They only cared about money and it really showed that me as a person did not matter. Fast forward two years later and I graduated and got a job in the tech industry. I worked my way up into management and was making a pretty killer salary. I had not thought about my parents in years, but I got a call from an unknown number and answered it to hear my mom's voice on the phone. She sounded older for sure, but it was a voice I didn't know I would miss until I heard it. She invited me over that weekend for dinner, and when I tried to bring up the elephant in the room, she told me that it was all in the past, that her dad and her wanted to move on and wanted to see me again. I was dumb enough to believe it and went to meet them that Friday night, bringing a nice bottle of wine that I knew my mother would like. We sat down and were talking about my job and in the back of my mind I was waiting for them to ask about my salary, but they never did. The meal went fine and my mother started cutting us slices of pie when the big thing finally dropped. 
They told me that after years of taking care of me and raising me for 18 years, they wanted my house. They said they looked into it and saw how nice it was and they deserved it for putting up with me for all of these years growing up. I walked right out of that house, but it was not the end of things. They actually tried to show up to my house and claim that it was their property. I came home from work and they were in the house with the deadbolt on the door. Then they ended up calling the police on me for trying to break into the house. I explained to the cops that it was my house, but they were talking about being my parents and the ones that actually owned that house. I did not have the deed and could not prove anything in that moment, so we had to go to court to deal with this, because they were set on trying to steal my property. In court, I was able to show proof of ownership, but my parents had a different strategy to try and get the courts to agree with them on things. They talked about raising me for so many years, only then to get hurt in return. They said how they got nothing in return and were just trying to take what was rightfully theirs and reclaim the money they had lost for the 18 years I was living under their roof. The judge was furious for my parents wasting his time and told them off for being gold diggers, telling them that taking care of me when I was a minor was their legal responsibility and could not later ask me for compensation for the fact. They even tried to argue that if they did not get the house, I should pay off their mortgage and give them some type of monthly stipend. They left the court as losers and embarrassed at the fact that they were gold digging their own child, which was obvious, and they looked disgusted. They tried to contact me again about money, but I told them if they called me one more time, I was going to have them arrested for harassment and attempted extortion. I told them that they were nothing but gold diggers and having a kid just to try and get money from them later was one of the most disgusting things a parent could do. I don't care if I hurt their feelings because honestly, I don't know if they even have any. And yeah guys, if you would have been in OP's shoes, would you have helped the parents financially or would you have acted the same way as OP? I think the answer should be obvious, but I'm curious what you have to say. Either way, while you're at it, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like the video, because that would help me tremendously. The next one is an HOA revenge story. Short history, fall 2005, SO and I buy our first house together, we are happy, baby's on the way, house is cute and in a new subdivision, HOA just formed. We are at the end of a blunt cul-de-sac, quiet, no traffic, neighbors are nice. However, three-ish years later, the US economy crapped the bed and wiped us out. Over half of the homes in our subdivision have been foreclosed on or are in the process. Me and mine are not paying on our mortgage. So we have moved out and a family friend and his family have moved in. They lost their house and he pays me a discounted rent. I'm not paying the mortgage but maintaining the house with his rent. The HOA is having trouble maintaining the common areas and keeping things clean because of lack of funds. Junky cars and dead slash dying landscaping are everywhere. One home burned to its foundation. A few months after my friend moves in, red fire lane paint is applied to the curbs of all the cul-de-sacs in the subdivision. I am furious because it prevents street parking in front of the house. Anytime I need to stop by to fix something or my tenant has a guest, we must park in front of a neighbor's house or in the common collector streets and walk in. I called a local fire department to ask why they need so many fire lanes, seeing how there were no hydrants nearby. They told me that they had not requested additional fire lanes nor had they asked for curbs to be painted. They said anyone can just paint a curb red, it's the signage or a hydrant's presence that makes it a legal fire lane. The paint's just there to help you interpret the signage. I check and sure enough, no signs. Come to find out, it's a ploy by the HOA to drum up even more funds. If they paint curbs red and call it a safety zone, their bylaws allow them to fine a homeowner for violating the safety zone. Funny also that the HOA president lives at the end of the wand of the cul-de-sacs and now the neighbors can no longer park in front of her house without getting safety zone fines. So then one evening, just past twilight, Light, wearing a high-vis vest, safety glasses and work boots, I painted over the red curb with boring grey paint, specifically designed for concrete with great coverage. I do the entire cul-de-sac. Three weeks later it is red again, two days later grey, five weeks later red, then grey with silicone top sealer, then red that flakes off almost immediately, then red again flakes, then a sign that reads safety zone no parking. For the lack of payment, the home is now under notification of foreclosure and I am working with an agency to help navigate and file all the paperwork needed so we can short sell. 
Short selling in this context means that although we promised to pay the bank $350,000 plus interest for the house, they would forgive any amount we own as long as we turned the house over in good condition, for example not flush concrete down the toilets or poke pinholes in the water pipes. Which screws us, but it's better than owing 350k on a house worth only 165k that will be legally taken from us in short order. F you Reagan, I'm still waiting for the trickle. Anyway, during a short sale you're required to notify any potential parties that could have liens on the house and well, this includes the HOA, I'm up to date on my dues and I have no outstanding violations. So of course I think I'm in the clear, but no, the HOA suddenly comes up with a whole list of violations that have not been addressed or remedied for 5 months, plus additional fines for the delay. The HOA then said that they notified me in November already, but cannot seem to produce copies of these multiple notices of violation. They only have the current one in March listing all the outstanding violations, examples, black stains on driveway, uncoiled garden hose, unapproved tree, missing bush, missing foliage, dead tree. I informed them that the stains were tire marks from driving into the garage, the unapproved tree they did in fact approve and the missing bushes they approved the removal of. Here is a copy of the plan and your approvals with your name on it. It's not my fault that you don't know what you approved. The dead tree, well many trees tend to lose leaves and fall, like around November, they might look dead if you're just making up violations in February, but are just dormant and waiting for spring. And even if it was dead, you cannot replace a tree in November, December, January or February. No nursery sells saplings that late in the season unless you want a jewel tied tree. How can someone be reasonably expected to replace a dead tree in the off season? The HOA delays responding and the short sale is on a timer. If I don't have all legal items, payments for liens and documents into the escrow officer by this date, my short sale will fall through and I will owe 350k plus interest on a $165,000 house that is soon to be foreclosed on. Their HOA fines and fees total around $1,955, $45 short of where felony fraud starts. I'm absolutely furious. This HOA is gonna F me one last time and I will pay for the experience. So then I talk to the escrow officer and see what she needs. Only the money for the HOA lien and you will close escrow tomorrow. She has seen reams of these come through with similar amounts of fines requested by HOAs that hold up short sales. None of them exceed $2000. I ask her what form of payment will satisfy her as an escrow officer, money order, cash or a check. A check would be easiest for you, don't you think? If I write a check to the HOA for $1955 then hand it to you, that will satisfy escrow? Yep. You will mail the check to the HOA after the document's record? Yes. You will have a check in 25 minutes. Well, the next day, on the phone with the escrow officer, sitting in my car in a parking lot at 9am, did the document's record? Did the short sale go through? Yes, I will mail out finalized documents and any other items before close of business today. Thank you and hang up. I then walk into the local branch of my bank and inform the teller I need to place a stop payment on a check. Edit, my bad, I did not include the fallout, so here it goes and the HOA never tried to collect or contact us again. And the next one is titled, you wanna try to take 9 inches of our property? We will take 20 foot of yours. We have lived in our house for about 8 years in a rural neighborhood in Arizona. About a year ago, this dude from California bought the lot next to us and threw a fit about the stuff we had on the property line. We had put a single fence pole vaguely where the property line was, we had not had any sort of land survey done, it was supposed to just be a temporary marker that became a permanent marker. The dude was absolutely livid that we had vehicles parked on his property, the very tip of one of our cars was touching the established boundary and he threatened to have our vehicle towed. So we simply had an actual land survey done and it turned out the property line was a good 20 feet into his property. Homeboy should have just let sleeping dogs lie and not been an a-hole about a few inches. Edit, I had some journalists reach out to me and ask for some more comments so here are the updates you ask for. So this is a small rural neighborhood in the mountains of Arizona, all the houses are 3-5 to five acre horse properties. The roads are all dirt and unmaintained, it used to be a very understandable place to live but in the last few years it has been developed and property values have been going up, even quadrupling since we moved in here in 2016. 
This has attracted a crowd of people who care what yards look like, who simply were not here when this was just cheap. The neighbor is one of these new people. We moved here specifically because the neighborhood had a bunch of messy yards already and we wanted to also have lenient neighbors. We lived in harmony with our neighbor's junky yards for years. The neighbor introduced himself by calling the county on a bunch of us anonymously. We knew that he called on us because he was bragging about calling the county on several other of the neighbors for their messy yards. So whether he intentionally included us in the report or not, he brought the inspectors to the neighborhood. He came on our property by at least 40 feet before there was a fence to closely examine our piles of scrap metal. We caught this on camera and confronted him in text. It turned out he was very angry that he had purchased land next to a pseudo scrapyard. Also, we had several cars in various stages of disassembly and piles of materials. Also keep in mind, this is the country. This is normal out here. We are on 5 acre lots. Another detail that I missed in my original post. He is not even living on this lot. He bought a lot with a very small cabin 3 houses down along with the lot next to us with the intention of turning it into an income property. After we confronted him in text, he confronted us in person in our front yard, leaning against our no trespassing sign and screaming obscenities at us. Number three, we have not even seen him since we saw him on our security camera observing the survey markers dismayed. It's entirely possible that we entirely chased him out of the neighborhood. The people on the other side of his lot who have an equally trashed yard from their small scale pig farming operation that he should have known existed before buying the land had such a bad experience with him that she had a restraining order on him. They are also having a potentially equally funny dispute about a shed that she built fully on his lot over 15 years ago, which means they are going to have to go to court over who now owns it and our adverse possession laws are certainly on her side. Currently we are building an ugly fence on the newly surveyed property line. And yeah guys, that was certainly a property drama saga. And by the way, if you have any property drama slash neighbor stories to share that happened in your own life, I would love to read about them either in the comments or on r slash ripe stories on reddit, which to be honest is a much better place to post fully fledged stories and there's a good chance that I will read them in a video. Thank you so much in advance. And the next one is titled, I just did what I was told to do. A decade ago, I was an administrator for a hospital. One of two admins, a couple of techs and a few application support people and a couple of programmers. Our boss, the IT director, let's call him Fred, had a temper. Whenever something happened, if we didn't go directly to him for guidance, then he would get angry. Now, most of the team he never yelled at or got mad at because he didn't know enough of IT to understand their jobs. For some reason though, probably due to my demeanor at the time, not anymore thanks to him, I just took it and did what was asked and what was needed, he would take his anger out on me. It was so bad that the team often referred to me as the sponge, able to take Fred's red-faced yelling and after he vented he was fine for a few days until something else set him off. The catalyst. One morning our primary outward facing web server died. This was not unexpected as I had been telling Fred that it was old and needed a refresh but he called me an alarmist and said as long as we had a system backup that we did that it was not an issue. I mentioned if hardware died we would have to have the hardware handy but it fell on deaf ears. Well, when it died, I got an alarm about it and I was in the data center trying to get it back up and running when Fred comes in and tells me to get it working right away. I tell him I'm already on it but it is looking like the RAID controller is host. That I doubt I could get it up soon and that I would need to harvest parts from DCOM servers to build one if he wanted it today and to order a new server immediately that the specs were in his email from me. He tells me that I have 30 minutes to get it back up and running or I will get written up for refusing an order and for neglecting my duties. I reply that even if I could get a server built and OS loaded in that time, it was going to take more than 30 minutes to copy the data over to the new server and that I cannot change the laws of physics to suit his fancy. He replied with, you know, I have 29 minutes and walked off. 
Yeah, he wrote me up for it. I took an hour to get it operational and the data took about as long to copy, but it was up in under 3 hours total. If I didn't sign, I would be terminated immediately, so I signed it but added under duress. And now the beginning of the end. A few months later, Fred came to my desk and asked what I was doing. I told him I was going over patches that needed to be applied to various servers and hardening the ones that could not be patched for various reasons. Fred asked me who told me to do that. He had assigned me a job and he expected me to get it done. The job he had assigned was setting up a laptop in one of the conference room for a CPR refresher class that was next week. It was Wednesday and I had all day that day and two more days to get it done. He chose me and not a tech because, well, I never knew why honestly, even the techs were baffled but you never argued with Fred. Anyway, I explained that I had plenty of time to get that done and would ensure before I left on Friday that it would be waiting and I would even come in early to brief the presenters. Well, that was not good enough. Fred proceeded to yell at me for 30 minutes in his office with the door closed per usual about how how I was insubordinate and he paid me to do what I was told when I was told to do it and that anything I thought that needed to be done I was to immediately forget it existed and do only what was assigned by him. I was to be at his disposal at any time, I was on call a lot too and that unless something was physically on fire I was to do only what he explicitly assigned me to do. I said okay. Q malicious compliance. For the next several months I did exactly as he instructed. I did not mention patches or scan for vulnerabilities. I did not even log into a server at all unless he told me I needed to do something specific. I did not even restart services or disable terminated users unless he told me to. We would get a list of terminated users each week but unless he told me to work the list I did nothing. The other admin did the same as well since it would have made his job impossible if he did it all. Then one day I got asked to apply for a position with corporate. I went to the interview and they already knew who I was and basically said they wanted me. They mentioned that policy stated they had to tell Fred and I told them that if Fred found out he would fire me because he would not like the promotion over him. The role would have made me over his data center but not his team. They said they doubted he would do that so I said okay. Well sure enough when Fred got wind of my promotion he fired me. The worst part was he fired me in a way that made it impossible for me to get the corporate job. They rescinded their offer, no reason given, but after speaking with a lawyer it got changed to resigned because he would have made it impossible to work for him if I had returned. The fallout of the story, a few weeks later I had another job, better pay and I was the IT manager, about 6 months later they had a data breach. It was nasty and all over the news, Fred was encouraged to resign. I learned much later that someone from my old team had contacted corporate and told them what happened and why Fred fired me and he got in really hot water. Then the data breach happened and he was going to be fired and he knew it so he resigned before they could fire him. I looked him up a few times after that, he tried life as a contract project manager but never finished any projects. Now he's retired, wonder why. Why? Edit, since there is a question as to how I got screwed out of my promotion, I will paste my reply here, I'm sorry to leave it so vague. Corporate offered me the job on a Tuesday to start in 3 weeks. Fred fired me on Thursday. By Tuesday of the following week Corporate reached out and told me that due to me being fired they were no longer able to extend their offer. The person that called me was not the person that hired me. I told them to contact the person that hired me because he knew this would happen. They said it is not their policy to do that and I am ineligible for a review. I even tried emailing the person that hired me and he tried to go to bed for me but corporate HR told him I was not eligible for rehire. That is when I went to a lawyer. The lawyer wrote some letters and was able to get them to change my status but because corporate hired someone already for that role I would have to take my old role. I declined for obvious reasons and thus the resigned status. And yeah guys with this we have reached the end of the video. However if you cannot get enough of my content please don't 
don't forget to subscribe to the channel to not miss any of my daily uploads. And also check out my podcast by searching for Ripe Stories on Spotify, Amazon, Audible and other podcast platforms. You will often find exclusive episodes and early access to new content. Furthermore, please check out my Patreon by going to patreon.com slash ripe YouTube or my YouTube membership program for even more exclusive stories. Thank you so much and I will see you again tomorrow.